Okay, um, let's get started. I think it's actually good that we don't have that many people here. Um, so my talk is about cloud native DevOps. Um, you might have already heard about this term before, um, but you know, but something that I'm gonna explain later. Um, first of all, um, a bit of introduction about myself. My name is Emma Fang, and I'm based in London. Um, so as you can pick up from a little bit of my accent, I'm not from the US. I came all the, all the way from London, and I'm a cloud security architect at EPAM. As a consultant, I love design and architect everything in the clouds for my clients. Um, so EPAM, just a little bit introduction about EPAM, is a technology consultancy uh, specialized in software engineering and uh, product designs, and we help our clients to accelerate and integrate security into their cloud transformation programs. So um, alongside my work, I also in, uh, volunteered in uh, a few UK-based uh, committees, such as the Women in Cybersecurity, we is uh, UK affiliate, and, um, and I'm also one of the industry advisory board um, committee for the computer science faculty at uh, University of uh, Buckingham. So that's, that's me. Okay, um, this is the agenda for today. I would like to give you a, uh, you know, a definition of what is cloud native DevOps. You know, when cloud native, how cloud native affects the DevOps practice. And then we will dive into the current threat landscape. Looking at attack vectors that sh and share some examples of um, some famous attacks. Um, happening in the four to five years ago, um, I mean the last four to five years, not ago, but um, yeah. And finally, I will wrap the session up with some um, strategies and best practices to help you secure your cloud native DevOps environment. Um, so, okay, without further ado, uh, let's dive into our first topic. So what is cloud native plus DevOps? There's no official definition of that, but in general, it's a principle that describes how people work together and to build and deploy applications that could leverage the scalability, flexibility of the cloud environment. Um, so it's often using technologies like microservices, uh, patterns, uh, containers, service for serverless functions, and uh, each of those microservices are implementing a business capability, communicating via a API, something like that, between different layers, right? As you can imagine, if you work in the cloud native, you know, DevOps space, you kind of know about this, and it requires a lot of, a lot of um, automations and continuous improvements and cross collaborations between teams. And as a result, we want to make sure that the product is faster time to market, and we can experience uh, things like, you know, benefits like uh, reduce infrastructure overheat, and uh, we can allow our DevOps people to innovate the product. So as a security person, um, have you ever encountered uh, the challenge where you, that which uh, makes you actually panicking? So recently, I've got a cloud native project. So I task, I've been tasked asked to, um, to, um, to, to secure the cloud native project. And two weeks into the project, I've been told, Emma, our application is actually being built. I was like, Hang on, I don't know about the security requirements for that for that uh, application yet. And then, as an architect, my first reaction is, I need to gather all the requirements uh, for this environment. I need to gather everything. I need to gather all the components. Then I panic. So, if you experience something similar to that, that's because you also experience the problem of security challenges security challenges in the cloud native DevOps space. So let me tell you a bit what is that. Um, so the, the, it, it is the speed of development and, and deployment. So we want to, the, this environment needs speed, which means that we want to push the codes much, much faster into production. 
sometimes in a matter of minutes, and it also makes it harder to have security gates to be implemented into the CICD pipelines. And we want to keep up, keep up with that speed. So sometimes we think, okay, um, you know, the microservices environment is already kind of isolated and, you know, highly re re uh, resilient and we have enough security, but actually it's not. How about the underlying infrastructure and the, you know, and the, C uh, and the SDLC process? So, yes, yeah, think about those things. And this environment is often targeted by uh, threat actors. So, on this page is a little messy, but um, I'm gonna talk you through this page. Um, the threat landscape uh, and the trends for the cloud native environment is evolving. The supply chain attacks remain the, uh, the, the major, the major um, concerns in the past few years, as we know that everything is in the you know, headlines. For example, you know, the log4j has been around for two years, but after two years, it's still a problem. Why? So that means that we are not patching fast enough, right? So beyond the supply chain risk, AI-assisted codes has also gained popularity because our developers love AI. We want to generate code from the AI and faster and productivity, all kind of, you know, benefits, right? Um, so, um, but the, the thing is, the question is, are we trusting the integrity of those systems that are providing us the, the, the you know the machine the the machine learning model that's providing us those uh, generating those uh, codes for us so th this all those questions raised and another thing i would like to mention is the misconfigurations you just don't know you're just so surprised how much miscommunication, uh, uh, sorry, misconfiguration risk that we have experienced. A tiny little errors could lead to, uh, to a, a massive breach. So we have seen so much in the headline. So I'm going to walk, walk through those uh, attack in a minute. And we have professionals, uh, security professionals, looking into um, the cloud native security risk. So OWAPS top 10, good job OWAPS, because you are nailing it. However, it's under development. So I'm, I'm doing some research into, you know, to, into cloud native risk. And then I've, I found this document in OWAPS. However, I mean, after a few years, it's still under development. I know that this space is, you know, is constantly changing. Like you can't just define a risk for the cloud native uh, security and just and just call it job done because it's evolving. That is the fact. And uh, you also need to constantly, you know, increase your, improve your visibility of all, everything. All the infrastructure, the components of your services. But um, yeah, it's, it's very challenging in this space. Okay, um, I know this, architect uh, this architecture diagram is a little bit overwhelming for you, some of you maybe. Um, but as an architect, I like diagrams, so that's why I put this diagram here. So on this page, I've broken down the cloud native environment into three key areas. The developer's environment, DevOps platform environment, and the application slash infrastructure environment. So let's start from the left button, which is the developer's environment. So as a developers, we all love IDE plugins, right? Uh, we, we, use, we use IDE plugins to, you know, to improve our code efficiency, productivity, and everything like that, and even security. So um, we want to use those tools, we want to integrate those tools as much as possible. Then we, it comes into the problem of, you know, are we trusting those extensions? And then uh, we move on to the DevOps plat platform where the build processes and the CICD pipelines are happening. Git repos and public container re registries are vulnerable to supply chain attack. We already know that. Um, and then one thing about this is, you know, that CICD pipeline, those risks that's happening in the supply chain go down to the CICD pipeline and get executed resulted in the remote command execution. And then the, the attack surface extended to your uh, application environment. First of all, 
if you move your eyes to the to the top left hand side you can see that I've labeled it as an external attack surface because I just don't know what is the better word for that because that is external attack surface and all, a lot of things like injection attack, application security attack are all exploiting everything on that application level. And then you have uh, APIs, API misconfiguration, that's so common and you know, um, you, some, someone is is handling the API keys improperly, proper, in and also, you know, the authentication tokens. If you are not storing it in a secure place, maybe it can it can get um, you know exploited. And then I want to talk about the issue of unmanaged uh, um, environment, right? So that is, that I, what I meant is um, something that's in legacy that hasn't been, you know, that hasn't been on, on your system, that's kind of off records. It could be someone that's stupid enough to use their personal credentials to create a, a random cloud workload in your environment. You just don't know that, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to have visibility on everything when your uh, environment is so complicated. There are so, so much moving parts, so much, uh, you know, APIs, cloud, cloud storage, and also, um, you know, the, the microservices architecture. So, in this table, I've got some attack techniques that are often used to exploit, uh, that we, uh, we can, we seen that often used to exploit the cloud native environments in the wild. So I would like to point out two, uh, a couple of things. Um, the first thing is the misconfiguration. It's often overlooked um, because it's often the, um, the entry point for an attack. And the second thing is the supply chain. So supply chain has a large attack surface. Um, open source dependencies and, uh, and the container images. But um, we also haven't forget the, you know, the proprietary so uh, software as well. So in both cases, those threats are not only affecting the service provider itself, but also extended to its customers, which led to uh, a much greater impact. I also want to remind you about the MITRE attack tactics. I, I trust every one of you have heard about it at some point. So, um, so basically after the initial attack, attacker, uh, the initial access attacker could look for ways to maximize their benefit within this environment. They can spread across the network and they, and they can use uh, uh, techniques to hide their tracks uh, through using the, the rookies and maintain uh, persistence by leaving a backdoor, or something like that. Okay, the first thing I would like to talk about is the cloud misconfigurations. So there is a statistics that I got somewhere. Um, <laughs> and it's, it was reported 45%, uh, there is a 45% increase in incidents caused by misconfigurations in 2023. And misconfiguration could be anything that relevant to human errors and, and they are normally hang, a low hanging fruit for the attackers. So. Um, so we just experienced a, a global outage. Um, the, the, blue, the blue screen of death, which is caused by a software update by a cloud strike. The, um, and also this one is an example of not a malicious attack, but is a good example of um, how a small operation error could, could cause impact on a global level. And, um, and now on my board here, I would like to talk about a couple of um, incidents in detail, well, not in detail, but a little bit. Um, so the first one is the Midnight Blizzard instance. So Midnight Blizzard is a Russian national, uh, national state threat actors. So they use the password spray attack to compromise a non-production legacy tenant in Microsoft environment, then leverage an OAuth uh, application to access to the corporate environment, such as the, uh, the Exchange server. So this attack has taught us how vulnerable our system is if without things, a basic uh, security controls like MFAs. Another uh, instance that I would like to uh, reference to is the, is the AI uh, Git, uh, GitHub repo data exposure that's happening in the 2023. Um, so as you know, this AI project becomes so uh, valuable target for attackers now. So in this incident, the 
the Microsoft AI research team um, instantly publish a bucket of private data, such as secrets and team messages, to a public Git repo. So the worst thing of this one is that the, um, some insecure token was used to share the data from the storage account, and the access was overly permissive. As a result, this makes the, this attack possible. And there are, um, you know, a, a few, a few uh, instances that are relevant to the, um, the S3 bucket and the st cloud storage. I don't need to mention them too much. Um, I will include a link in the resource at the end of the talk. You can look into them, but it's very uh, basic. So those attacks are all exploiting a very basic, simple mistake in the environment. Okay, supply chain attacks. Um, SolarWinds is a very um, popular one. Uh, I don't need to go into too much details about it. I think what uh, makes it, um, the second one is the most interesting one, um, that is the Travis API vulnerabilities. So in this instance, the public API calls was used to fetch clear text logs. And these logs contain sensitive information like uh, user tokens. Then those user tokens were um, can potentially use for uh, access to um, services like GitHub and Docker Hub. And the, and the other one that is um, Cassia ransomware attack. So this is another quite famous uh, ransomware that's ex exploiting the CICD pipeline and injecting ransomware into the, and that can be spread downstream um, into the, those business. And it also caused downtime for over a thousand um, uh, downstream business. I would like to talk about the um, open source um, supply chain attack uh, separately to the, you know, the normal supply chain attack because it is, it is um, a very, very popular attack surface. So Log4j um, is an open source uh, logging, um, a, a, is a logging uh, package. And then you, you, probably most of you already know about this attack. Uh, I don't need to go into too much detail about it, but you know this enables the attacker to gain remote access to the application that used the Log4j. And XZU2's backdoor is another example. Um, it's where the open source vulnerability campaign that went on for three years without being discovered. And the, the worst thing about it is because the malicious code has been injected into each, each of those versions of that, of, of the package, which means it's difficult to track and to, you know, to, to mitigate those risks. So on the left, uh, on, the, on the right here, I've, uh, I, I included a, a diagram that I draw myself. Um, so it, it kind of explains the, you know, the tactic and the, um, and the, the attack path of a threat actors, how they exploit this environment. Um, and then it's the CICD pipeline attacks. So um, for, the, for every stage of the pipeline, um, from code to commit to, uh, to production, um, they can be a target. For example, attackers can exploit how dependencies are put into downloading um, into to execute those malicious packages. And also, um, one thing I'd like to mention is the, the tools like Jenkins and GitHub, GitLab um, are often used to um, being exploited um, to launch um, attacks on the CICD pipelines. So, for example, the CI server uh, that runs the insecure uh, credentials and secrets that are happening in the CICD pipeline. And there is a, there is a, um, a blog that um, created by, uh, that's reported by the NCC group that has published something like uh, analyze 10 attack path through the security assessment of the CICD pipelines. And this blog have highlighted a few techniques, such as the shared runner can be uh, compromised to deploy malware and extra credentials, which we use to deploy into the uh, production systems. Um, another interesting uh, observation here is the uh, Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is a very popular IDE. I've been able to use it. 75% uh, of developers are using them. So 
a research has shown that um, in an experimental attack, that's the research. The researcher have uh, created a something that's very similar to the the genuine um, VS Code, uh, VS uh, the the Visual Studio deal, and uh, they uploaded this version onto the marketplace, and a lot of people just downloading them. They don't they don't know because. They are using a typo score, um, typo score um, techniques, um, so they they make it look like the real one, but so that that is the consequences. Okay, um, so I included a um, a very nice another very nice table here um, to explain um, what is this red lamp, the threat landscape of the DevOps. Basically, the CI/CD pipeline security from um, using a MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, so it's just for your reference only. But I, uh, I highly recommend it to you to check it out if you're interested. And then uh, finally is the cloud, cloud identity attack. In this one, I am going to talk about the famous uh, Okta attack. So what happens in the Okta bridge? It was in um, October 2023. So a service account was extracted with because it was stored in a compromised Google account of an Okta employee. And the account was then used by threat actors to gain access to the, um, the Okta's uh, customer support systems, which resulted in a file that contains sensitive information, such as se uh, session tokens, to be compromised. So these session tokens then leverage further to be penetration in, penetrated into the internal system of the, the customer of Okta. So this is uh, another example of supply chain attack, but using cloud, uh, a cloud, cloud identity um, as attack. Um, and this, and so although this initial compromise wasn't, was, wasn't successful, but in 2023, uh, sorry, what, but in 2024, in the Cloudflare data, data breach, I don't know whether how many of you know about this. Um, the, so the threat actors was able to establish a persistent access to the source code management system, big bit bucket, using the token that's stolen from the Okta instance. So on the left, I've used a, a attack path diagram to demonstrate this, uh, this attack. So as you can see, that's, um, so the, what, what I want to emphasize here is an attack could be uh, the start of uh, another, another data breach. So, you know, things, uh, misconfigurations, um, cloud identity attack, and everything like, um, and also supply chain attack are all interconnected. And then um, there is a cross. There's a quote here. So, so I just want to highlight here that as this report shows that only 1% of the permissions are actively being used um, by um, the, and the amount of workload um, identities and permissions, permission scars contributing to the rise of the accidental and malicious insider, uh, insider threats. So these are all um, exploiters to allow the threat actors to access to the cloud infrastructure. So what are the lessons learned? Okay, so, so how long do we have? Um, so the volume of attack against the cloud native environments is increasing, and attackers are adapting their techniques to move faster, and CICD um, workflow and DevOps environments are being targeted because of the amount of attack surface and the lack of detection. And um, the trust in the supply chain and the uh, open source software are rooted in uh, several factors. For example, um, you know, faster to time to market and cost efficiency and collaboration. These are all the benefits that our developers like about, but the trust can be exploited by those threat actors to launch much massive campaign affecting hundreds of business. Okay, now we finally go down to the zero trust security principles. How many of you knows about zero trust? Please raise your hands. 
I think that's everybody, probably. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds savvy. It's a savvy word. Yes, I agree with that. And it's a term that has been used by a lot of vendors to market their products. You know, we've got zero trust. Uh, features we've got the uh, all you know the like the the entire zero trust package. Please buy our product. Yeah. So you probably some people will probably hide about this term because of that. And a lot a lot of people are associated with uh, the commercial products uh, that does X Y Z X Y Z uh, features. However, little do you know, it's only a concept and a principle. It's not a technology. It's, not, it's a collection of things that can, um, can achieve a specific goal, right? So, so in the zero trust model, nothing is trusted. No application, data, databases, uh, services, or infrastructure is trusted by default. And everything including identities, network, uh, infrastructure, and applications must be audited, monitored, and verified. For example, uh, when one piece of the infrastructure or uh, application wants to speak to another, then it must be authenticated across, according to a uh, access policy that is constantly changing, is constantly assessing the, the authentication. And then, according to the access policy, it will grant the, do, do, do grant the, the access according, according to the least privilege uh, principle. So that's the zero trust principle. So how does the zero trust principle translate it into cloud native dev DevOps controls? So the NCSC defines zero trust principle in into further seven principles. So how does those principles translate into these controls? So let's start with identifying the cloud native, not cloud -native asset, the architecture. Identifying firstly the, you know, the, 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 the way that you use to innovate things. So what you want to know where your, uh, your developers are getting the, the third party packages, the open sources. Um, you want to be able to understand you know, what is in your, what is in your uh, environments, your data, your codes, your images, where they, they stored. And then know your user and service and the device um, identities. So in, in this case, you want to assess your user and devices um, and services behaviors. So you want to detect the anomalies um, and you want to secure the workload identities and you want to project the, the secret in the CSD pipeline. And then you want to, yeah, you want to assess your, 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 your user's behavior. So in order to do that, you need to understand what is your DevOps workflow look like? What is your CICD process and behavior? And can you, put, can you do a health check into your workload? And also, uh, you want to audit your privilege accounts. And then you use the policies to authorize your access access to all kinds of environments. You use uh, just-in-time access, and you can enforce a branch uh, security. I'll talk about that in a minute. And, and then, even for the APIs, you want to enable access policies for the APIs. Um, you want to, in, yeah, we want to control which way API is talking to which services, right? And there's a tool that uh, I put on the top here. It's called Cloud, Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management. So this tool is often used to manage the, um, the cloud identities within the infrastructure environment. And then you authenticate and authorize all the connections. How, to, how do you achieve that? Right, first of all, so you have so much DevOps tools. And then how do you know that the developers are uh, access to those DevOps tools and to to whatever they are they need to access to, to whatever the resource and environment they need to access to, it's difficult to to do that unless you integrate your uh, your DevOps tools with your IDP with your identity providers, with your enterprise uh, identity providers, and also enforce MFA on top of that, and enforce conditional access policy for the workload identities. I know that MFA might be difficult to. Uh, implement for your um, for for your uh, workload identities, and then you want to enforce this service to service authentication. Now, we focus, and then we we talk about you know the 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 monitoring of the users' devices and services. 
you could be using something like AI powers and automatic detection and real time observability um, is often provided by the eBPF. And security testing, you know, I don't need to mention about that, but um, there's something there. And runtime scanning, um, don't forget about those tools, those savvy, you know, t commercial tools like CSPN, K KSPN, and CWPP, something like that. Yeah, so those tools are all enabled, um, all monitoring and getting visibility into your environment at some point. And finally, don't trust any network. So talking about network security, you probably, uh, MTL, MTLS comes to the top of my head. And then you probably think about micro segmentations. What does that mean? That means segmenting your uh, environments into uh, you know, staging, production, and testing environments. And then another thing is, you also want to segment, you want to also use different runner, CI runner, to run the protective workload, uh, workloads, uh, sorry, to run the protected um, job. You don't want to mix them together. You need to set the, you need to configure uh, the, the different segregation uh, policies. Okay, um, now I'm going down to the very heavy, um, you know, detail content for the next, probably next six, seven, seven minutes. I'm going to be quick about it, um, fast about it, uh, okay. So how, how do you secure your application environment? You first start with establish your uh, security baseline to, that you can use to harden your infrastructure environment. Use things like CIS benchmark, or you can use the cloud vendor Pacific ones. For example, Microsoft Cloud Security Benchmark. If you're using Azure, it's a free, uh, it's a free version of that. Then you want to um, monitor your cloud work, work workloads and and use that to use tools like CSPN, um, CNPP, things like the cloud native uh, application uh, platform to um, to detect your abnormal um, the abnormal behavior within your environment and your cloud workloads. And you want to adopt uh, runtime security for your container workflows, uh, workloads, and also you want to detect your, uh, you, to monitor your uh, infrastructure, including the legacy systems, so you know that you don't have the shadow IT. And then um, you want to implement uh, the just-in-time policy and also the zero privilege standing admin accounts, so. So developers, or no, the, the, ops, the ops people often use the admin access into your platform. So you want to enforce the just-in-time policy for that. And, and of course, MFA, I don't need to mention that too much. Uh, everybody knows about the benefit of MFA, and although they are not, they are not attack proof, but they are good. And then you want to enforce the um, role-based access control policies RBAC and um, enable session re-authentication and timeout. And you want to block unauthorized and un 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 um, non-compliant deployment using things like policy as code, um, and you can regularly scan your um, infrastructure's code files to, protect, uh, to, pr uh, to detect any misconfiguration and configuration drift. And finally, is the uh, network security and, and the segmentation. So there are a lot of things about it. Firstly, you want to ensure that you're segmenting your, um, your, um, the infrastructure that they use to uh, host your application where your workload are running. And then is to enable the, um, the protection for your, the, the traffic, to prevent to protect your traffic going into your application. Also, or, and you can use the uh, eBPF to improve your network observability and enforce your runner security. So yeah, that is something you can look into as well. And don't forget network policy for the container and control um, and to control your traffic flows within the cluster between ports and external traffic in the container. Um, then, um, Okay, um, then, then I want to talk about the securing, how to secure your DevOps platform environments. So first of all, you want to regularly scan your code base for vulnerabilities, adopt the SBOM. Yesterday, we had a very nice talk 
about S bomb in the proving ground. If you don't know what S bomb is, go to check that out. And then um, you want to um, restrict access to your code repository and your container image registry. And in terms of in terms of your cloud native native uh, DevOps tool to chain, there's a couple of things I would want I would like to say about it. So would you want to ensure that you uh, that you only deploy or only adopt uh, verify uh, third party DevOps to uh, to integrations and you want to work with your third party team to work on that to to provide assessment on on those tools don't just adopt everything i know that a lot of application you know a lot of uh, project teams they like to do their own stuff one team adopting you know Jenkins, one thing adopting G, GitLab, something like that. Yeah, it's it's really complicated in in a in a massive environment. But the bottom line is, you probably want to uh, make that make that uh, consistent. Use the same tools across your organization, not to use different tools. And then to secure your CI/CD pipeline, how do you do that? Audit and monitor your CI uh, CI/CD runners. So there's tools. Um, there's, I think there's, there are tools that you can use, uh, which is based on the eBPF again, and that can use to um, improve your visibility on your CICD runners. And, and secrets, uh, secrets within CICD pipeline is, is particularly vulnerable because they can be everywhere. There are so many secrets and don't hard code your secrets. And that is, and that is very basic security best practices. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people do that still nowadays. Um, and also, m you want to manage your secrets uh, properly. Finally, secure your developer's environment. Some, some, sometimes everybody just not, um, you know, just not care about developer's environment because they, they want them to innovate. They want them to, to do the job that they need to. But the thing is, there are risks associated with that with that environment. For example, um, you know, developers can use their own personal um, access code, access tokens, access to your to your code repository and your development environment, and yet yeah, all, all those things like that. So, my recommendation would be you want to enable single sign-on and integrate your DevOps tools with your organization's identity provider using the identity uh, federation. So that's the, probably the first step you want to do. Then again, you want to ensure that you enable the just-in-time access. Then um, I'd like to talk a bit more about the extensions and integration security. Again, third-party security risk needs to be done needs to ensure that you are integrating the right tool. And, um, and when you are getting something from the marketplace, think twice or maybe third times before you actually you know, integrate your, your things. You want to verify this is actually the, the genuine tool that you want to integrate. And then finally uh, is to implement branch security. So you want to protect your branch, you want to establish branch uh, protection uh, policies, um, including approval workflows for the code changes. So that comes down to the change management, the entire topic on the change management as well. You want to secure access to your policy, uh, repository and the pipelines by applying different kind of permissions. Um, yeah, so that's it for securing your developer's environment. So what are the key takeaways? In this session, we have uh, explored uh, the complex real landscape of cloud native environment. Thank you very much for staying with me until now. Um, so basically, to, you want to shift left. Uh, shifting left is not, uh, it's not enough. You want to shift everywhere including every stage from the code to the, uh, to the deployment in your, CICD, uh, in your uh, SDLC. And also, you want to harden everything, not just the application itself, but including everything around it, the identity providers, the CICD pipeline, and the cloud platform. And verify every single uh, connections. 
it's not just the application, the services, between the services, but also verify your users' access to the environment, your developer access to the, you know, the, 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 dev, the, the CI environment, something like that. And uh, always assume breach, which means that you want to exercising, um, want to exercise uh, defense in depth. So security controls on just one level is not gonna be enough. And um, so cloud native environment is not a static state, which means that you want to protect your, um, you want to ensure that your runtime, is to ensure the running application are monitored for the malicious activities or attacks. And finally, automate security. Um, you can use tools and technologies to streamline the, um, to streamline the securing and to secure your supply chain attack, uh, supply chain, supply chain um, environments, and also to enforce your security policies um, by automating everything. I think that's everything for my talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and so I have included my, um, you know, my LinkedIn profile here, so you can connect with me. And there's a link here, you can get all the resources that I use when I'm researching this talk. Um, so I hope that you learn something from this, but if you don't, that's okay, because I learned something from it. Okay. So. Oh, any questions, sorry. Emma, thank you so much, and I hope you're surviving. Our temperatures are a little bit different from here in London. So um, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation the, what, the fact that developers value speed. How, as a security cloud architect, how do you articulate that you can achieve that value with all the things that you just described? I, I find that that's normally a, a point of contention. So this is a lot of stuff for us to do or for somebody to do, how does that align with being able to meet speed to market demands for certain development products? Makes sense, that question? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think, I th I think uh, the s speed is, is crucial as well as sec security. I wouldn't say that you don't want speed, but you want, but the thing is you want to have a framework, you want to have a baseline that is already implementing to enable that speed. So, the, which means security is integrating within all the stages of your SDLC and within your environment, uh, you have, you know, you have things that can monitor for misconfigurations, such as policy as codes, things, things like that. If you have been implementing those, um, those, those foundations in your environment, you will be able to e enable speed. So, that uh, unfortunately, this is not something that that can be done fast. It requires a very careful, you know, architecturing in, and then refactoring your application, something like that. Um, yeah, so that that is that's how I communicate. Uh, you know, how I um, ask my 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 developers to enforce security. I know it's hard, and um, yeah, because I've I've been there before. And the thing is. But luckily, my, my, my developers are very uh, buy into my approach. When it comes to SBOM, are there any automated tools we can use for scanning? Oh, sorry. I didn't know that. <laughs> SBOM, I think. Would you like to answer that question? I have a friend. I, sorry, I didn't put you on the spot. But she delivered a talk yesterday. I think it's very good for her because she's an expert in that. So I think it's better for her to explain this. Would you mind? Maybe we can talk after this. But uh, there are some open source tools, which is by Anchor, Trivi, OWASP. OWASP is the very well known, the Cyclone DX. And uh, Trivi has like, it is also integrated with the Docker desktop. So it becomes easy for you to use it. And Anchor has Sift that is available open source. You can just use it for free. Or if you use Anchor as a whole, it comes like with everything that integrates for SBOM. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Is that a good answer? Yeah, okay, great. Next one. Sorry, I think mine is also an SBOM question. I work for Alan Friedman at CISA on the SBOM team. Mm. Um, and so you 
I love that you mentioned SBOM as a tool for like getting to know your architecture and what's in your cloud environment. So um, we uh, have these community groups that talk about SBOM and one of the groups uh, published a paper on how SBOM applies to cloud and they identify some ways in where SBOM falls short. So are you using SBOM for your cloud environments and if you are, how are you using it? Yeah, I think SBOM, um, so I think SBOM can be used in a way that it can also monitor not just the application packages, but also the infrastructure environment as well. I, I think that is what I understand. So for example, infrastructure as code template, this can also be in the SBOM. Um, you know, you can put, I think SBOM, Talking about SBON, I mean, if we fix our mindset into the SBON, it's just about you know the the packages, the third-party libraries. Then I don't think that that's the right approach to use it. My my thought about the SBON is in the future the SBON should be a, a repository that that um, that is a collection of what is the right uh, templates, what is the right infrastructure templates, and that is what we want to use to enable uh, compliance within the cloud environment. I mean, I might be wrong, but that, that's, that's what I think about how, how we can use SBON to achieve this. Does that answer your question or no? Sorry, I don't have anything. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm not that, you know, I'm not uh, specialized in, you know, application security, but I'm more towards the cloud. But I think SBON is a very good tool. So I think it can be extended to, to, to do cloud as well, to ensure the cloud environment is compliant. Any more questions? We are unfortunately out of time, so we can definitely, if you have some time to stay afterwards, we can do that, but. Thank you.